that seal the promise your very body began to alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground Well, good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Great. Well, we're excited to begin the Advent season and to look forward to the coming of Christ, Christ's birth. Um, so as we do that today, we will do some readings together. We'll sing some worship songs, and then uh, we also have communion this morning, so... If you would, please stand, and we'll begin with a reading. And this is from Isaiah, um, where the prophets foretell of the coming Messiah. So let's read this together. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, 
and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. first candle for Advent. And as we do, um, let us pray. O oh God, as we light the first candle of this Advent wreath, we open our hearts in hope. May the light of this candle remind us of the hope we have in you. May it inspire us to prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ our hope, and our Savior. Amen.
Amen. And now we'll read a retelling of the gospel. Um, And this is from a passage where Jesus meets with the woman at the well. Um, And the song we're going to sing is called, Oh, Come to the Altar. And in this song, it talks about, um, do you thirst from a drink from a well? There's the line. (laughs) So so the passage we're going to read explains that a little bit. I'll start, and then you guys can join me in the second uh, quote that Jesus says. So Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water, water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank for it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of? Yourself. Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood. Bow down before 
Let's go ahead and let's go to prayer. And what I want to do is, you know, what we just sang was about that idea that inside of us, there's this longing, there's something that's been important to us. There's something maybe that we've been praying through or thinking through over these last few weeks. And I just want to give you a moment as we start this service, just to quietly talk to God yourself. So I'm just going to have you quiet your heart and quiet your yourself and and kids you can get in on this too but let's just take a moment whatever it is that you need to ask god for or whatever you need to tell god Father, there's things that are on our hearts. There's things that we're concerned about. There's situations that we just don't even know how to handle. Maybe, maybe just today we feel alone. Maybe we feel a weight. And it's not even a wait for us. Maybe it's a wait for someone else. Lord, I just, we want to come and we want to, we want to ask you, Lord, what do you want us to do? God, could you, could you give us the contentedness of heart enough to be able to just turn to you and ask you, God, what is it that you want us to do today? Because we got to admit, we don't know. God, we have to admit that there's times where we're not sure what the right thing to do is, or we're not sure what the right way to handle it is, or Lord, maybe we, maybe we regret the way that we did handle it. Lord, we want to come to you this morning because we really do believe that you're calling to us. We believe that everything that you do is good and right and perfect in a world that is anything but good and right and perfect. So God, could you, could you just meet with us today? Could you remind us what you, what you think of us today? And, and could you help us to get a better view? of whatever the situation is that's in front of us. We're grateful that you listen. We're grateful that you have promised that if we, if we seek out wisdom, that you give it generously. You, you promised that you would counsel us with your eye upon us and lead us in the way that we should go. So Lord, today, we're just grateful that we can come to you and feel at home and feel that you really have our good in mind. So we turn these things over to you today. Lord, help us to, to leave that there. 
be, be with those that are hurting. I know some who are, are going to be going to funerals this afternoon. Be with them. Lord, think of Vicki and pray for uh, healing for her with uh, her rib as that was injured and broken yesterday. Uh, Lord, it seems like she's had some real challenges, but be with her. I pray for Cheryl and Ron. And Lord, as he's been ill this week, and we just ask again, just that you would, would heal and give doctors some wisdom to know what to do and what's wrong. And, and I know that there's other, other needs, uh, backs that hurt and, and colds and, and all of these types of things. Lord, help us just to be able to just trust you. We ask for healing. We ask for, for help in all those situations. Lord, we love you. Our hope and our confidence is in you today. So we ask that you would just come and meet with us. We pray it in your name, Jesus. Amen. So it's good to be together. Have a few things to remind you of. Uh, one was, I wanted to mention to you, we mentioned about uh, Gina had uh, two prayer lists or, or, or gift lists last week as part of our Advent conspiracy where we're just committing ourselves during this Christmas season. We're not going to give into the rat race. We're not going to get into the rush. We're not going to get into the pressure of trying to come up with the perfect gift. We're going to enjoy Jesus this Christmas. And as part of that, we're also looking for opportunities to give and to be generous. And I'm so grateful because we, we mentioned those two gift lists last week and, and people were incredibly generous during that. And, um, but I did want to mention to you that one of those gentlemen that Gina cares for did pass away this week. So pray for Gina. It was John, right, Levi? John passed away. He had pancreatic cancer. Um, doesn't have any family. So I just want to ask you to pray for him and pray for us that we could find maybe an opportunity to be able to, to minister at least to those that are around him. Uh, pray for Gina because she loves him so carefully. I want to mention another prayer request for you. Uh, a lot of you guys know Erica uh, because she walks Jasper, which is a dog. Uh, he's a, he's a great day. Uh, I mean, a, uh, a greyhound rescue. And uh, she walks him around here all the time. And she also keeps an eye on our building for us. So she's really fantastic. Well, she messaged me last week and said that Jasper actually has cancer. So pray for her. Pray for Sean. Um, that dog's done so much to connect us as a family. Uh, but you know, any, any of you that have lost a pet like that, now he's still, he's still alive, he's still kicking, he's still dragging her around the yard. Uh, but uh, keep praying for, for her, because I know that that's a big sadness. And she asked me to pass that on to you guys. So I wanted to do that. Uh, other things, like we said, we will keep looking and trying to raise up opportunities so that if during this Advent season we sit there and go, you know what, if I bought one less gift especially maybe for myself, or maybe, maybe my kids wouldn't miss one more gift, but I could use that to be generous. We'll try and highlight some opportunities of places that we can be generous to others, because uh, that's part of our goal, right? Is we love to give, we love to bless others. So, so that's our Advent Conspiracy. I just want to remind you about that. I also wanted to remind you that next week on Sunday, right after Gathered Worship, we're going to have our family meeting. And uh, so I encourage you, whether you're a member or not a member, that you're certainly welcome to stay. We'll talk through some of the directions about where God's leading us with being part of the Great Commission Collective. We're going to talk about some of the conversations we've had with relationships, you know, with, with Harvest. We've been so grateful to be able to invite them in and share our building with them and share life with them. It's been life-giving. And uh, we also talk about what we see God at, at work at in our lives. So it's a really neat time, and everybody's welcome to come be there for that. So other than that, the details are in the emails and things. And if you're not getting those, just let me know. We'll, we'll be glad to add you in to that. Do you think it's time for junior church? Yeah, okay, let's do that. Why don't we let our kids go down for, for junior church, and then uh, let's take our Bibles and we'll turn to Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 2 this week. We're reading through this letter to the Ephesians. 
And we're reading through it kind of piece by piece as we go through. So what I want to do is we're going to read this week. um, I'm going to start in chapter 2, verse 1. This is what we looked at last week. And then we're going to go up through verse 13 today. We said last week that this rewrites our story. And it's so important the way that we, the story that we tell ourselves, isn't it? Have you ever noticed that, that um, the story that goes on in your head makes a huge difference? My dad used to tell this joke about how the scientists, these social scientists decide to, to do a, um, a test. And they took twin boys and they put them in separate rooms. And in those separate rooms, they filled those rooms with manure. And then they release these twin boys into these rooms. No other toys, just manure. Well, when they checked in after about 15 minutes on the one little boy, he was sitting in the corner, just sad, not much going on. And they thought, see, that's an appropriate response to a room full of manure. Then they went over to the other room, and the other kid was, he was like wrist deep. He was digging in the manure and he's throwing manure all over the place. And he's having the greatest time of his life that day. And they came in and they said, what are you doing? He said, well, there's this much manure in the place. There's got to be a pony. (laughs) Perspective makes all the difference. The story you tell yourself. So what I want to do is remind us of the story that God's telling to you and to me about who we are. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, And you were dead in the trespasses and the sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. And who's the prince of the power of the air? That's the devil, right? That's our enemy. It is Satan. And, And who was following him? In, with the way that this story is told, who was following him? We were. Now, notice I didn't say you were. We were. This is the reality of all of us, right? The spirit that's now at work and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived. When we think through our story, we realize that we were the ones that were the sons of disobedience. And and what does it describe? It says we lived in the passions of our flesh and we carried out the desires of the body and the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And, And kids, just in case we think this way, sometimes when we've grown up to church, we sit there and go, that's not me. I mean, the worst thing I ever did was I took a, soda out of the fridge when mom didn't notice, you know, but, but, but what it's saying is that this is us. This is who we are. This is the nature of our souls, but it doesn't end there. Verse four says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. It's a gift. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strengthened. Strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So this is the word of the Lord. 
Well, let's look at that together. What I want us to understand is um, first what he says there in verse 10, that we are his workmanship. When you think about this, I was kind of asking this question. I remember someone asking me this one time. They said, if you had to picture what God, like what God's face looks like when he thinks of you. You ever wondered about that? I told you guys a story before about how one time in my youthful enthusiasm, Scott, I was probably five or six years old, and I always woke up before everybody else in my household. I woke up early enough that, kids, you guys probably don't remember this, but there used to be times when TV wasn't really on. They would literally just play static, or if you were lucky, they would play the national anthem and a flag would be flagging on there. I would be up before that, and I would sneak in and turn on the TV, and there was nothing on the TV. So I remember I, I had woken up on a particularly sunny Saturday morning. I knew it was Saturday morning because of the events that ensued. And I walked into the kitchen. There was nothing on TV. But you know what I heard? King, I heard birds outside. And they were whistling. They were making noises. I thought, I could probably make those kind of noises. So you know what I did? I sat there and went, <laughs> you know, I was trying to be a bird, make bird noises. I figured people are good at this, right? So I'm sitting there trying to make my bird noises. And I woke the bear. That's how I know it was a Saturday because my dad was home. And I heard my dad come stamping down the hallway to the kitchen. Apparently, my dad must have loved good bird noises because I was making the best bird noises anyone's ever made. And my dad must have come to listen to the bird noises, right? Now, that was not the read on his face. <laughs> he walked into the room. He grabbed me on both sides of the head right behind the ears, and he picked me up in the, in the air. And he said, shut up. <laughs> he put me back down, <laughs> and he went back down to his room again. The face said it all. What do you picture when you think of how Jesus thinks of you? Like, what does his face look like? I'm not going to ask you to answer that out loud, but I think there's some value to actually thinking through that. What do you think he thinks of you? What, what do you think his face looks like? Well, I want to remind you today that his thought may not line up with yours. Some of you would probably think, when Jesus thinks of me, he think, he, his face kind of gives that like, oh, it's the best I could do. And there have been some of us in our lives where others around us give us that face. Or, or maybe even worse, the face that looks like, hey, I'm so, it's amazing I have to put up with you on a daily basis. Some of us know what that face looks like. Some of us know, though, what that face looks like when that face is warm and excited to see us. So my question is, is what does Jesus' face in your brain look like when you picture what he, what he looks like when he thinks of you? I want to remind you that here, like we read in verse 10, it says this, we are his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. When Jesus thinks of you, one of the images on his face is, I made that. And I made you unique, and I made you with specific gifts and skills, and there's a joy. For those of us that are in Christ, he says, I created you to do amazing, wonderful, but unique kind of things. You may not do what the person seated next to you do. You may not have their skills. You may not have maybe some of the attributes that they have. But he says, I created you to do incredibly important good works to make this world a better place than, than you found it. Now, he's going to give more details to us as we go through the letter. But one of the things that he laid out for us is his priority in chapter 1, verse 10. 
His priority in ver- chapter 1, verse 10, is that he's going to unite everything in Jesus Christ. It's really important. It's important for us to understand that because unity is one of the important realities of what it takes for us as Christians. God created us to pull together in the same direction. God created us to work together to be able to fulfill his purposes to carry out these great works. What's key? This first ingredient that we're going to see today is unity. It's oneness. It's being connected. It's instead of seeing other people as my problem, or instead of seeing other people as the issue, it's seeing that God said, hey, I've called you to be part of a family. And that's why we have one of our DNA markers for us spiritually is that we're family. It's incredibly important that we understand that. Now, if you understand, remember we've talked about Ephesus before where he's writing this. This was a a really metropolitan kind of town. You had people from every background. You had people from every kind of religion. You had people who sat there and said, we should all embrace everybody else's religion. and We should all get along and just do that kind of a thing. You had people from every uh, geographic background. You had people from every racial background. You had people from every uh, economic background. Lots of different types of people. Now, there was one group that stood out because they wouldn't go along with everybody else's religious views. And these were the Jewish people that lived there. And everybody saw them as intolerant. But then you have a group of Christians. And they're the only group that everybody else doesn't really like in this, that doesn't get, because the Christians say, no, we worship Jesus, who is God. The Jewish people around them sit there and go, nope, that's blasphemy. You are not even right. And then the rest of the world around them sat there and said, no, you guys are not even right. So now all they experience from the culture around them is the sense that they are not of value. In fact, they're the problem. And yet Paul is writing to them to say, with all those differences, if someone were to um, walk into that room, they would look around and go, man, I see all sorts of different skin colors here. I see people from all different backgrounds. I might even hear some different languages that are spoken here. I see some of you guys that have a lot of money, and I see some of you guys that are slaves. How do you all get together? How how does this group function? But Paul's saying, man, that's one of the most important things that we've got is the ability to open our arms and open our hearts and connect with people even new people, and bring them into our lives. So I want to do, I want to show you, he's saying that's the priority. That's what Jesus is doing. So how does he do it? Well, I got to tell you, it's not just a lecture. Instead, what he does is he reminds them. And he wants to remind them who they were. He wants to remind them what that did to them and who they're going to be. And then I just want to apply this to you quickly, okay? So in chapter two, he says, it's so important. The way that we are going to have unity inside of our churches, the way that people will be able to open their hearts and let other people in, the way that we can actually forgive, the way that we can be connected. We've got to have a good memory. We've got to remember. So he wants us to remember these three things. Number one, he wants them to remember who they were. So in verse 11, he says, Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh, that Gentiles in the flesh was, they were viewed by the people who saw themselves as religious, looked at them and said, you, you guys, you guys are pagans by birth. And they looked down their noses at them. That's who you were. Nobody was interested in who you are or what you brought to the table spiritually. The truth was that their background, the sin that they had been involved in, the families that they came from, actually made them despicable in their eyes. 
And they were told that that made them despicable in God's eyes. And they were rejected. That term uncircumcision, remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision. Picture that as a racial slur. That's how harsh this is. And what they're saying is, you're being rejected because there was something about your physical body that just didn't meet God's standards. They were that far out. They were that far away from God. They were that far from being accepted and approved of. Paul calls the other ones out, though, because what we've talked so far is about is the, these Gentiles who were seen as, as so below par. But then he's also talking to these ones who said, no, but we're the religious ones because we're the circumcised ones. We were part of the, the children of Israel. We're part of God's family. But what does he do? Notice that he uses that idea that they were, uh, that circumcision in the body by the hand of men. What physically we do to our bodies doesn't change our spirits. You're not Jewish just by your physiological reality. You're Jewish by what's happened inside of your heart. And that's what they didn't understand. So Paul's talking to the, the people who were not religious, the people who had the bad background, the people who you'd sit there and say, what are they doing in church? He's also talking to the ones who thought that they were really good, that the ones who grew up going to, say, Sunday school, the ones who, you know, who, who had all their Awana badges or maybe their, their Sunday school little metal pins, you know, for uh, perfect attendance for all the years that they were there. He's calling out these ones as well and saying, you're not justified by your good works. So what he does is he says, in your past, he says, I want to remind all of you as Christians that none of us were acceptable to God by ourselves. None of us could earn our way to be made right with God. Now, that doesn't sound like really good news, but it's proper perspective because he's not saying that's who you are. What he's saying is you need to remember that that's where you were. We need, it's important, it's necessary to be able to remember where we came from. Instead of seeing ourselves as God being lucky to have us on his team, there's a different perspective, right? Where we feel fortunate that God would even want us. The second thing that does is then he reminds them what that did to them. So in both of these situations, you have the non-religious and you have the religious. You have the, 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 maybe the very moral person and the very non-moral person. You have the person who, who sits there and says, I don't like going to church or I hate the church or I hate Jesus. And these are some of my friends. They'll tell me these things. I understand this. I get what they're saying with that. They don't often really know Jesus. But then I have the other people who are here. They sit there and go, I go to church all the time. But when you talk to them, you get the sense that they hate it. They don't love Jesus. They don't live for Jesus. Those are the two groups that he's talking to. And he says, okay, since both of you are really the same person, this is what happened to you in verse 12. He says, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Both of these groups were without God in the world. So he's reminding them. He's saying, hey, remember where you were. Remember where you came from. Remember how this started. But then he says, I want to remind you of who you have become. Instead of this long list of all the pluses that we brought to Jesus, instead, he goes on in verse 13. He says, but now in Christ Jesus... You who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That, that's the kind of statement that should cause our hearts to sing. If we remember well enough who we actually were, when you hear this statement, 
When you think about the reality that you go, man, I cannot believe that in Christ, the one, those of us that were separated just from the very birth of us, those who were separated from the covenant community, those of us who were alienated from God are now in Jesus Christ. And they're what brought near. The doors were open and you're allowed to be part of this community and they get to be close to God. They get to walk with God like Adam and Eve did in the garden, in the cool of the day, not just in heaven, but right now. Remember, we've said that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is ours already. In other words, all the connection, all the dependence, all the open doors, all of that is wide open for us with God. That's a massive transformation. A massive transformation. We get to be close to God, but also a result of that is we get close. We get to be close inside of our faith family. I don't just have a biological family. I have people like you who care. And it doesn't matter what my background is. It doesn't matter what my reputation is. It doesn't matter if nobody else wanted me. This is one of the places where we can actually be honest and transparent and people can know our stories and love us anyway. It's a place where somebody can walk in through these doors. And and again, we often say not these doors, but the doors of my house, because the front door for our church is the front door of your house where my friends can belong well before they believe. No matter what your background, no matter where you are, it doesn't matter your political affiliation. It doesn't matter these things. You are welcome and you are loved. And Paul is saying, guys, that when we remember well where we were and we remember now who we've become through blood, right? Whose blood? Jesus's blood. And what did Jesus's blood do for us? It paid for our sins and brought us, adopted us into his family. It filled us with holiness and with righteousness. It fills us with redemption So what does it look like? What he's talking about here is the reality that our hearts begin to rise up because we sit there and say, you know, God gives his best to those who deserve his worst. And do you believe that you fit both categories on that? If you do, Christmas takes on a whole new meaning. If we really believe that God sides with us against our sin instead of siding against us because of our sin. That's the truth. And and that should be reflected when you think about what does God look like when he thinks of me? Like, what would Jesus' face look like if he walked in the room and he saw me walk in? I hope that when you picture that, instead of him having that look like, hmm, I pray instead that we would be filled with this reality that Jesus loves. You know, the real Jesus attracted all sorts of failures and exiles and rejects. Jesus attracted underachievers. Jesus attracted weaklings. Jesus attracted compromisers. Jesus attracted losers. Jesus attracted the scum of the earth. Every kind of defeated, fed up sinner found their welcome with Jesus. (laughs) Scott, you know what that means? You and I are in, (laughs) right? We get to be in on this deal. That's a good thing. Right. (laughs) So we don't just believe that God put us in this world then for me to show other people how wrong they are and correct them and scold them and treat them like they're lucky that they've got me. God didn't put us here for that purpose, did he? God put us in the world to comfort other people. If I have a good memory about who I was before I came to Christ, 
And that transforms who I am by what Jesus has done for me. I love to hand that on. I love to pass that on. I love to make room for people that are incredibly different in my life. So what I want to say is this. A healthy sense of self is what we're talking about here. A healthy sense of self comes from balancing who I was with who I am in Christ. Your life will be healthy if you can see who you were. And the more that we can face that and be honest about that, and the more that we can see our need, and we balance that with how incredibly rich and generous and giving that Jesus was for us. Right? My future is incredibly bright. Not because I did anything right. So here's a couple of results real quick. We'll end with this. The better I can see and remember and hold on to that, the better that I can understand who I was and how much I've been forgiven so that now I am more loved and accepted than I can even dare to dream or to imagine. The, the better I have that balance, number one, it gives me a healthy view of myself. Some of you guys are like me, where you have, to, to put it nicely, you have a hard on yourself personality. You are far more keenly aware of all of your failings and weaknesses and where you blow it than you are at all aware of where you bring positives to the world. Now, probably in a room like this, there's some other people who are on the other side where you are far more aware of all the positives that you believe that you bring to the world and maybe need a little bit more awareness of where your failures and sins come from, you know. But if you want to have healthy balance, if you want to be able to be a healthy person who can walk through their life, not just in self-loathing, because self-loathing is not love. I do not love my wife more by hating myself more. Our culture kind of indicates that. I do not love my wife more by loving myself more. How, how do I love my wife more? By being free to love her more. By being freed up from having to be the center of my own attention. Amen? Amen. I want, I want to have a healthy view of who I am because I want to be healthy enough to be able to love others well. That's the second part, right? If I've got a healthy view of myself, if I know my past and I know who I am now in Christ and that matches up really well, guess what? I'm able to actually have a healthy view of others in your sin and strangeness. Because there are two categories, right? There are some areas where you might sin against me. There's some other places where you're just weird, all right? And I am too. There's things that you do that I sit there and go, what? I don't get that. Like people who eat olives. It doesn't make sense, all right? Amen? All right, there's some people who agree. <laughs> Dale's like, what? All right? But there's some things, that, and that's strange. It's not sin, all right? I, um... People who wear toe shoes like I'm wearing right now. See? That one. That's a big stretch. You can't love me unless Jesus is working in your life when I wear these shoes. That's why I wore them today. And they're comfortable. All right. So, but, but the idea is I need a healthy view of myself and I also need a healthy view of others because those little people that live in my house, right? Now, for my house, they've grown up. But we had them for a long time, Right? They're fantastic, except for when they're whistling at birds at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I can't have a healthy view of myself, of, of them, though, unless I can have a healthy view of myself. And I need to know who I was and who I am now in Christ. But if I have a healthy view of others, it will actually help me love them regardless of their background. Now, this is critically important for us as a church because it's not just in our houses. It's not just in our marriage. I believe this will make all the difference inside of our marriages. But I also believe that it is so critical to do here. 
Because I get to pick the people who live in my house, in a sense. But Jesus didn't call us to just love the people that we are naturally connected to. And in fact, he called us to love some of the people that we're going to find challenging. We talk about our DNA mark of family, and people sit there and go, well, I've been here, and I feel like, like family all the time. There's just people who bug me who are here. I'm like, do you have family? Isn't that like the definition? And yet, do I love them? Do I go out of my way to connect with them? Do I reach out to them? If someone were to come here on a Sunday, will we welcome them even, if, even when we find their story? And in fact, if I have a healthy view of self, I will actually love them more when I hear their story. I'm not inclined to be judgmental. I'm inclined to be someone who connects and brings them to Jesus. Because if Jesus loved me, how could he not love them? I don't need to judge or fight or destroy or separate you if I have been forgiven this much. How could I not help you find the same source of forgiveness for your life? If God could love me, it makes way more sense to me that he could love you. Because you know what? The biggest sinner I know is me. And that completely changes my view when I walk into you. So if we can remember our past and remember who we are now in Christ, it helps us to have a healthy view of ourselves. It helps us to have a healthy view of others. That leads to unity inside of our body. Because as strange as you might be, because certainly I'm, I'm not, but you know, maybe, maybe some of you guys are. But as strange as guess what? As one body, we can, we can, we can work together. Where, where that's important is often God raises up people who have passions for certain things, certain works, certain ministries inside of our body. And I love those different passions. But guess what? If I'm passionate for that, I want to open the door for you to be part of it. But I'm not going to be angry at you if you're not called to the same thing I'm called to. And that comes to ministries. That comes to like preferences where you sit there and go, I like this type of music and someone else is like, I, I like that type of music. Guess what? I don't have to be separated from you when we have these different things. I can just sit there and go, man, I'm so glad you like olives. Here, have mine. I got extras. But it leads to Unity. And unity is actually one of the surprising things in our culture because when people walk in here and they look at you guys, they look at us as a group. First of all, they're amazed to see what a wonderful group of people you are, but they're also amazed to see that you all get along. You love each other. You care about each other. The door is open and welcome regardless of someone's background, regardless of where they're coming from. We love and we actually work to help each other. That's our calling. So being family makes us servants. And don't forget, it also makes us missionaries. Because we sit there and we say, hey, I don't just want to hang around with the family I have now. I, there are people in our community who don't know that they're loved. They don't know that they can be connected to God. They actually think that they hate God or that they, and, and, and there's some theological reasons for that, but they actually think that they, you know, that, they, that they've grown up saying, I, I, I don't like going to church. I don't like being around the church. And yet, as we live our missionary life, as we connect, we allow people to come at least understand better who God is. I want them to be able to access the same growth, the same welcomeness, the same forgiveness, the same transformation that I've been able to have. We don't sell anything. We don't force anybody to believe anything, but we invite and we go out of our way. So we invite people over our house to eat. 
We, we, we love to go out on the boat with our friends and hang out in the middle of the lake and spend time. We look for opportunities to connect with new people. That's just the life of our church. So the results are we get a healthier view of self, a healthier view of others. There's unity in the body. And then this last one, though, I want to end with is this. Unless we have a healthy memory of who we were and what God's made us into, unless we have that, we won't worship. Because worship is not music. Music helps us worship. So music is really important. But music is not worship. Worship is when my heart is deeply thankful to God and loves who he is. Worship is when I sit there and say, I don't need anything else if I get to have this connection with God. Worship is me sitting there thinking, how could a God like that love somebody like me and bring me into his family and adopt me? So worship is singing and worship is praying and worship is giving and worship is when I sit there and I eat some sort of a food. I'm okay for my, um, see, we're, we're smoking a turkey this afternoon. All right. I'm really looking forward to this. All right, because this is awesome. I love getting to cook and eat. But, but when we eat good food and we sit there and think, there must be a God in heaven to make food like this and then give it to us. That's worship. Worship is when I sit there and I think, man, God is amazing and I love him. So we worship God when we watch our kids play. We worship God when we get to the top of a mountain and we can't help but talk to somebody else about the view. We worship God when we express our thankfulness to him. If I understand who I was and who I am now, that's the furnace for worship. I mean, it just, it's, it's that wood stove. It's that place where that fire can really kind of grow and put off heat. So we want to worship God. I can't worship, though, if I don't remember who I was, if I don't understand that I have been rescued. It's an awesome thing to get to worship God that way. So I want to just give that to us as a challenge this week. Will we be willing to just remember who we were and be honest about it? Will we be willing to reflect on all that God has done for us and all the truths about what he says, that you are holy and that you are chosen and that you are dearly loved? Will we actually worship God by sharing that with others? Letting them know that they are that too. Sitting with people that we don't know, carving out time, caring for them, paying attention to them. This is what it looks like. Now, notice I didn't say that you have to get on a boat and travel to Burma. Notice I didn't say that you have to be able to go out and, and you know, do all these kind of big religious works, go to the end of the world and find the golden fleece that's hanging over it and bring it back. I'm calling us to is just to be mindful, cognizant, understanding, and appreciative. This is what God's done for us. And it defines our lives. And we're grateful. So Lord, help us this week just to understand that, to recognize it, to love it, to be thankful. I just pray that, Lord, you would actually stir up inside of our hearts a worship for you. Because it's probably not even necessarily natural for us. But God, I know my friends here. I know that they long to worship you day by day, because they're so thankful for all that you've done for them. 
And they want to give their lives away as a result. So Lord, can you help us do that? I know you can. And I know that there's nothing better that you could give to us, so there's nothing better that you would do for us. We love you and we trust you. We pray it in your name. Amen. As we get together and join together for communion, it's that reminder, right, that Jesus established over 2,000 years ago that we were children of wrath. As Mark said this morning or earlier, we are alive, we are brought near by the blood of Christ. As our guys come forward, I asked Tim and Dave to help me out here. I also want to remind you of, of everything that Mark said this morning. Because of Christ's blood, because of Christ's broken body, this is a picture of unity together. And, and just real quickly to remind us, number one, right, it's unity with God. We now have unity with God because of what Christ did. We can now confidently come to the altar because on that night when Christ died, right, that whole, the curtain was ripped. We now have direct access to God the Father so we can come directly to him and not have to go through anyone else because of what Jesus did. But just a reminder that this is also a reflection of unity with each other. A couple ways that this shows is in the past, did, did Jesus just do this alone and say, here's what you do? No, he was sitting at a table with all of his disciples. He was sitting with fishermen. He was sick, sitting with an icky tax collector. He was sitting with a revolutionary zealot and other guys to say, this is a picture of us joining together over my broken body, over my spilt blood, right? Also, it looks to the future. Do you know the next time, do you remember when Jesus said he was going to do this again? It's going to be all of us together in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus, sitting when he says, I will do this again when everything is made right, when I am sitting with you together. And we have that future to look forward to. That's all of us. That's all of the churches everywhere, all of the believers, past, present, future, joining together with God and with Christ. But just remember that today as we join together, it's a picture as everything Mark was saying. Everyone, socioeconomic classes, different mornings, right? Different educations, different peoples all joining together with the same focus. We're focusing on who Christ is and what he's done. So today, as, as this plate, as this cup gets passed out, let us reflect, let us remember Jesus and the life that he gave us internally, that we now have forgiveness, reconciliation, and life, but life externally. We now have life with each other. We have life with his church as we grow together. And he knows ultimately that we need those reminders. That's why he's established us. We need to be reminded regularly. Also, just remember that as Paul wrote, this is a, a believer's picture. This is for believers to partake in. But also know that even before these elements can get to you, you can cry out to Jesus. You can say, I throw myself on the altar. I throw myself on um, believing who Jesus is. I need your help. And that can bring about instantly unity with God. And then you can ask for his help and growth as you grow together. So that could be yours this morning too. All right. So, so as we play, I'm going to pass these out.
is his body and the wine it is the blood that binds us now in the living bread remains the communion of the saints sing the mystery of faith flesh and blood flesh and blood you are my children flesh and blood if you believe so take this cup and when you taste my flesh and blood remember me so hallelujah for the bread is his body and the wine, it is the blood that binds us now. And the living bread remains. The communion of the saints sing the mystery of faith, flesh, and blood. We remember, blessed Jesus, we remember. God, help us all if ever we forget. That the author of the story cast off his crown of glory for a crown of thorns in flesh and blood. So hallelujah for the bread that is his body. In the wine, it is the blood that binds us now. In the living bread remains the communion of the saints. Sing the mystery of faith. Oh, we remember, blessed Jesus, we remember. God, help us all if ever we forget. In the living bread remains the communion of the saints sing the mystery of faith, flesh and blood. On that night when Jesus was betrayed, the evening before everything happened, really all of history happened at once. On that night, Jesus took bread and he broke it with his disciples. And he said, put my glasses down. Sure. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. And which is for us, which is for all of us. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the wine also that night. And he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. God, thank you for this reminder. Thank you that we know that we have acceptance in you because of what you did for us, because of your broken body, because of your shed blood. We now have forgiveness. We have life. We have unity with you and with each other. Help us to continue to grow in that. Help it to reflect in our lives every day as we praise you and are thankful for you and grow more and more in your likeness. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Amen. you can cup, pass your cups into the inside. These guys can pick it up. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, please stand with us. We have one more song to sing together. And this is one of our family's favorite Christmas songs. So it's called Go Tell It on the Mountain. It talks about Jesus Christ being born, so it's a little early, but 
<laughs> it's a song about um, proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel, which we talk so much about today. Um, see if I can get Pastor Mark's quote right. It was, uh, Jesus sides with us against our sin. I think that's how he said it, right? Not, not against us because of our sin. Um, so that's really good news, and that's, that's the gospel we can proclaim to people as we go from here. Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born While shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angels chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in the lonely manger, the humble Christ was born. God sent the salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Amen. So I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.